Was him being kidnapped a justification for him snitching or ratting as, as, as he now has that stigma? Like, would you, I mean, if, if, do, you, oh. do you think it's reasonable for him to, to have turned on people that kidnapped him and tried to extort him? Listen, I mean, the whole situation is a conundrum that I don't think I, myself or most human beings will ever be part of. And, um, and, and whether or not I have, it's not as if I have, uh, you know, I have some strict moral code of my own about snitching. Like, I mean, I think most people who have, who have that, understanding or are, are on the internet shouting about rats and snitches probably don't know anything about what it's like to be in an organization like that. I'm the hottest artist in the world. Yeah. Just from a photo, he got 10,000 followers in a day. He would do whatever to be famous. He was dangerous. He said, I am going to be a rapper. I am C9. Danny, he was a cool Hispanic kid from the ghettos of Brooklyn. He had face tattoos. That was his whole thing. Shock value, shock value. The more he became 6 9 the more I became obsessive with attention. I'm going to say to all my haters, which I made me relevant. Gangs have always played a very big part in all of our lives. The bandana was the biggest prop he could ever use. I hate white thing. Is he really a blood? Come on, you gotta go. You gotta go. This is a use use game. If you don't want to get used, get the f out. Well, I am here with Vikram Gandhi, the filmmaker behind Six Nine, the saga of Danny Hernandez. Uh, amazing documentary, super compelling. Amazing to see, especially his early years and where he came from, how, how he got to become this, this personality. Were you, how, how did you decide to, that you wanted to do this documentary? Or were you a fan of him? Did you notice him on the internet? You know, what, what, what compelled you to, to do this? It was really about discovering 6 9 online, just like everybody else, and realizing that he was in Brooklyn. And uh, I live in Brooklyn, and I, I, I realized I'd been to Bodega he worked at so many times. And, I knew the neighborhood, and so I felt like I was close enough um, to pursue making the film. And it really comes down to how compelling the story was. The story that was happening, um, that was evolving over the time while, uh, before he went to prison, was something that had so much of what was exciting about New York hip hop, but also this dark side of, of criminal activity. Plus, it had so much about the future of social media and how the music industry was changing. So all of those things combined made me think, you know, this is an interesting story. Let's see where it goes. And um, I would say a lot of this film was me having a hunch, having some motivation to do it, being interested in just going down the rabbit hole. Um, I think that for me and a lot of people, we grab it, we, we learn about Takashi not uh, necessarily through his music, but through uh, his antics, right? Um, how do you, where do you put his artistic value versus the internet troll? I mean, do you think he's all troll or is there, is there an art form in the trolling? And, and, and do you think that he values his music and, uh, and his artistic expression as much as his antics? I, mean, I th look at the art as the whole package, you know, I, my interpretation is what he was doing was the act of recreation of turning himself into this avatar of Takashi 69 and that transformation and its platform uh, and its way in was hip hop music, but it was definitely just part of the whole um, creation of a character. And he says in interviews that he had created this villain, that he was going to become this villain and create a world around him. And he was going to live in that. I think that, um, there's artistic merit in his music. It's not necessarily something that I was super into. Um, I was more interested in the whole picture, the whole story of that creation. I think the antics are all part of it. And social media is its own platform. It's its own um, place that a new form of art can be created. And so in a lot of ways, I looked at that as something that was kind of admirable, that he was almost a performance artist, that it was using hip hop as a way in. Um, I think what it comes down to with art sometimes is what's your motivation? And, 
and I think that's what a lot of we look into the film is where it was all heading. Um, was it was it to 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 be the best artist he could, or was it to um, acquire money, fame, clout, and was that really the goal? Um, so I think that his art form was the whole thing. You know, that's how I went into it. And, uh, you know, only he really knows what his intentions were. Do you think that he's like, um, like the next chapter in the great American tragedy? Uh, do you think that his life is going to end tragically? Or do you think that it's going to, uh, you know, there's going to be some sort of redemption going on going forward from here? Well, I think that we were all kind of astonished when he came out of prison and was even bigger. He, it was, you know, I think we were all astonished when he came out of prison and he became Takashi on the next level. But that was a moment that I think we were all leaning in and trying to understand, is this guy going to um, try to have some redemption, some reconciliation with the past? Is he going to um, apologize for his behavior? Is he going to do anything to uh, reinvent himself now that he's gone through this trial? And it turned out that, no, he was going to hold even tighter to his beliefs, be a big deal and take it to the next level. And that's, uh, I think that was surprising to all of us. Um, as far as how this is going to end, I mean, I don't know. You know, I think any intelligent creator like Takashi is, uh, can reinvent himself. I just think the face tattoos and the persona of Takashi 6 9 may make it hard for Danny to have a new, um, instance uh, but you know I, I i think that reinvention was something that was part of his whole plan from the beginning so i i think that it's possible but i think that you know ultimately it's everybody all of his fans it's everybody who gave him the clout those are the going to be the deciding votes on whether you know he has a career left over the course of making this documentary did you did you like him more or nope. less? And or, and another question is, did you feel sorry for him more or less as you worked on this documentary? Uh, um... Well, I thought I think that when you're making a film about somebody and you're looking into who they are, it's not really a matter of liking or disliking them. It's about empathizing with them and trying to see all the different angles and complexities of a person and following in their footsteps um, in order to understand that life. And that's what we did. We just tried to follow in his footsteps. Um, I think I was, I, I think there are moments where I was amazed at the things he created, um, how he did it and how DIY he was from the beginning. Uh, it really was a testament to someone with a great ambition to take limited resources and architect his own fame. So I think I was impressed by that at the same time. Um, there's so many toxic elements of his story uh, that made me shake my head constantly of like, okay, this is a really dark tale, you know? It was really getting into sort of the darkness that that was coming out of Takashi 6 9 And the whole film is really about trying to debate, or try, trying to balance the reality of who Danny was in Takashi 6 9 the good, the bad, the ugly, and try to give a human, um, tell a human story in it. And uh, so I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, you know, I would say through empathizing, I both, uh, and, and humanizing him through our story, I both uh, became more disappointed as I went on and more impressed at the same time. Um, it's, it's not that I would say I like him or like, or, or, or hate him more, but um, you know, it's just really trying to, we were really just going into a place where you saw both sides of it. And that's, I think what makes the story compelling and interesting is, is to, 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 to have to constantly balance that. Well, I, um, you know, his relationship with the Treyway uh, group, with the Treyway gang, is, is, is complicated, right? Because when I'm watching the documentary, and I've, I've obviously, you know, read a lot about and uh, seen a lot of interviews before this uh, um, about that story, um, it kind of seems like each party thought they were kind of using the other. And, and, you know, did you get a sense of that, that they were both taking advantage of each other? And when each of them realized the other one was actually taking, trying to take advantage of them, their, the schism began? Yeah, I mean, you, in the film, a character named Bodega Bam says it's a use-use game. And it's not so dissimilar from everything in entertainment or anything in business. Like, relationships are built and friendships are built off of equally mutu like mutually beneficial interactions. And 
collaborations. And, and mutually so detrimental I, sometimes too. Sorry? And mutually detrimental sometimes too. Yeah, absolutely. And so, I, you know, I think that that's a pretty common thing. I think what the, I think a big difference is, is that, you know, if you consciously join an organization like the Bloods and you're put, you're, you're decidingly giving, you know, sort of an oath of allegiance to something, you're going to be, if you decide to, to, you know, live in the streets like that and make, and take that oath, you're, you're supposed to defend them whether they're right or wrong. Uh, that's, that's part of the deal. And I think that you're playing with fire if you're not going to uphold that. And I think that's, that's what you saw. I think the other thing is that um, when you're a young artist or a young business person and you're making stuff with your friends or relationships that are loose or a group of people, managing those relationships and expectations when it comes to profiting and money is going to get very complicated. So um, what you see is somebody who dangled fame and fortune or, around a group of people. And then when that came, um, didn't really know how to share and didn't know how to, to manage those relationships and those promises made. Um, and I think that's what it looked like was that, you know, this thing got out of hand. If you're, if you're rolling with a crew of 10, 15 to every event you have, and people are going out on a limb, committing acts of violence for you, uh, putting themselves in danger and other people, it's, it's not going not gonna, to um, go away one day when you decide not to work with them anymore. And I think there are going to be fights and um, there's going to be arguments and there's going to be breakups. Uh, it's just a matter in this situation where violence was involved. Interesting. So, yeah. So do you think that when they tried to kidnap him and, and extort him that, you know, when they took him out of his, his car on the road, was it because they felt that he owed him something that he hadn't paid up? Because that gets a little a little tricky, that, that situation, even in the dock. You know, one of the tricky things is that Harv was on a, was not sentenced yet, so we could not really we could not do an interview with him. Um, that's kind of a, a tricky territory to get. You know, unfortunately, we weren't able to get his interview. Um, but everything has been recorded. That whole interaction is recorded, right? And Takashi posted about his injuries the next day. Um, as, as far as as far as um, the kidnapping, I mean, what you see is what you see and what is documented is somebody pretty close to him who was just not happy with him. And clearly it was about money and clearly it was about loyalty and about expectations that were not met. And I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think there's a justification for someone being kidnapped, but, um, you know, I think that you see in the film that they're all, everyone was completely violent acts that Takashi was the ringleader. So it's just, you know, and I, I don't know if it's karma, but I think you kind of are in a situation where if you're, if you're creating a violent situation, you, you might have violence put upon you. Now, you, you said it wasn't, you know, there's no justification for kidnapping, but um, was him being kidnapped the justification for him snitching or ratting as, as, as he now has that stigma? Like, would you, I mean, if, if, do, you, oh. do you think it's reasonable for him to, to have turned on people that kidnapped him and tried to extort him? Listen, I mean, the whole situation is a conundrum that I don't think I, myself or most human beings will ever be part of. And, um, and, and whether or not I have, it's not as if I have, uh, you know, I have some strict moral code of my own about snitching. Like, I mean, I think most people who have, who have that understanding or are, are on the internet shouting about rats and snitches probably don't know anything about what it's like to be in an organization like that. Very true. Very true. It, the lack of understanding is coming, the understanding that most people have is coming from watching movies. You know, it's coming from uh, the imagination of it. There is a complicated world. There are other informants. There are complicated relationships. Is this an organized criminal enterprise or is it a loosely group, a loose group of people? What I do know is that there are people who went to prison who were his best friends 
closest friends. Um, there are people who went to prison who who committed violent acts that he himself orchestrated, mm. paid for, uh, coerced people into doing. And so that's quite problematic. Um, there are people on the periphery of things who were, did not kidnap him, who had nothing to do with the kidnap him, kidnapping, and who also kind of, you know, seemed to be his friends and, elite, and had allegiance to him. And there are some of those people who went to prison for that. So, um, yeah, whether whether the, you want to believe in like the code of the streets and snitching and rats, sometimes it just comes down to friendship. Right. Um, now, in the in the documentary, you 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 show how you reached out to him and his management. Um, is there? Do you, why do you think he didn't want to um, give his side of the story on this doc? Is uh, do you think that he he doesn't want to answer challenging questions and just kind of control his own narrative? Uh, what what do you what do you think? Because uh, he's he's usually a loudmouth, you know, typically, but. And I think it's all of them. I mean, it, I think it's about controlling his own narrative. I think it's probably about perhaps one day making his own version of the story mm -hmm. uh, and profiting off of that. Uh, I think it could be for all of those reasons, but I don't really know. At the end of the day, um, you know, we just put it out there. Uh, I'm, I, I would be psyched to do his interview now, um, get his side of the story, open up questions that I still have that are, have been unanswered. Um, you know, I can't say why they didn't go for it, but it's a responsibility as a filmmaker that I go reach out and, and say, hey, I'm making this movie. Do you want to be part of it? Have you heard of anything through the grapevine about what his, his reaction to the doc would be? I, I, I got a feeling he'd at least like the, the, the first half, like the beginning stuff, because like, you, you really showed, showcased like how he came about. So any reaction from him maybe, you know, got to you through the grapevine or, you know, through intermediaries or you haven't heard from his people? Well, one of the people who manages him um, is, you know, who calls himself his manager now, um, who was not the person we contacted at the time. He has... Uh, publicly said on his Instagram that he denounces the film, um, that it's trash, and he also denounces the Showtime one that is also in production right now. Um, and so that's as much as I know is just reading about that online, uh, people who've retweeted his Instagram posts or articles that have been written about it. So my understanding is that they perceive the film as trash, um, but I don't know if that came after watching it or before watching it. Um, right. I have not heard from them directly at all, though. And personally, like as a filmmaker, that's you're dealing with like some sensitive stuff. And, and like you said, violent people. Is there a part of you that's like, oh, man, am I going to and do I have to kind of like watch my back with, you know, Takashi now or, or, or his, you know, associates? Is that any does that cross your mind at all or it doesn't really matter? I mean, it only crosses my mind because people ask about that. <laughs> You got, do you have security? You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, may, maybe maybe he hates the movie and, uh, you know, one day he'll have vengeance. No, maybe, I got a feeling he secretly likes the movie. He appreciates the, that somebody decided to make a film about him and he'll figure out how to, this, like anything else that's happened, turn this into um, a talking point or a stepping stone into something else. I don't really know. Maybe he's maybe he's happy about it. Maybe he's flattered. Maybe he's angry. Uh, I'm not watching my back though um, any more than I normally would. So, so um, you had Sarah Molina's baby mama on the documentary, and she gives a really compelling uh, uh, interview that that I hadn't heard before. Um, was it was it hard to convince her to be part of the documentary? I think that this is a very traumatic uh, part of her life, a really important part of her life, and something that's dominated. Um, so much of her story, especially in the public eye. So it did take a long time to talk and, and get access to her and talk, you know, talk to her and finally get an interview with her. I would say it took many months, um, uh, uh, probably six months, seven months. Uh, persistence pays off, um, I think. And also, uh, you know, we just kept asking. We just kept asking. And um, the truth is that when six nine was sentenced, and when he was take he was he came out of prison, the story, uh, in a lot of ways, I think people became more forthcoming about being involved in it. I think some ways that this was the moment before he was able to tell his narrative that they could somehow, 
you know, have their voice heard. Who knew what was going to happen in the future? And I think in a way that that window uh, may have closed if they didn't get a sense, a, a chance to tell it. So I think it was a mutually beneficial thing to get this out there to the world and to also humanize her point of view. It, in so many ways, Sarah's involvement in the movie and her, her perspective as a woman balanced out this very, very toxic, male, violent, clout chasing storyline. Um, it gave a, just a, a different face to the story that I think is important to understanding his character. And you know, it's a perspective that I think is rarely heard. The, uh, the, the wife of a famous rock star uh, or, or the, 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 the mother of the child and what that experience is like supporting somebody uh, who's getting to the heights of fame. So um, we're, you know, we're just really happy that we were able to get it. And as far as her being reserved, you know, I just, I think she's just really um, just precise in telling the story from her perspective in a real way and not, and not um, letting it affect her negatively emotionally, you know? Okay, so last thing I gotta, I gotta bring up is um, people have been mentioning that there's one major plot point that, that was not, was left out of the documentary involving Sarah Molina and Shadi, their affair. Uh, how, why was there no mention of that? I, I, some people are wondering that to get Sarah Molina to be on the documentary, you might have had to promise her to leave that out? Nah, that's not true at all. Um, listen, nobody knows, nobody knows uh, what happened behind closed doors of Sarah Molina sh slept with Shadi. What I do know is that our film, first of all, I don't believe that um, adultery is a... <laughs> Is any reason to put someone in jail or like cooperate with the with the FBI? Uh, yes, in, in a Shakespearean way, it's like betrayal, your best friend betraying you. But in a lot of ways, that's not something that we would get to the root of. Um, if it's a he said, she said, it's a losing game. I also think that um, when it came up as a reason that that affair was a reason for Takashi being violent towards her. I felt like that's there's no justification for violence against um, a woman um, and to justify it with like ra ra rationalization would reduce what was happening. The truth is that there was violence that she talked about from early on in their relationship. I mean, there isn't any particular reason to leave it out, except that to me, it just felt like that's not really the level of journalism we're addressing. We're talking about criminal activity. We're talking about people attempted murder. We're talking about a, you know, drug trafficking, being in, involved in an organized criminal syndicate and, and, the, and the reaction of the FBI towards that. That's where it was coming to. Um, I think the internet is a better place to debate whether or not 6 ix 9 his baby mama slept with his best friend or not. I think, I, I think that social media is an awesome place for that debate. To me, it just didn't seem like, if I couldn't get to the truth of it, if I didn't have a justifiable, um, it wasn't able to prove anything, it just didn't feel like it was something that needed to be addressed in the story. Uh, again, yeah, so that, that's the reason, but it's absolutely not something that was negotiated with Sarah at all. Like The, the internet talks, but I, I think that's just part of the buzz of this documentary. Um... Well, listen, I, I think it's it's very compelling and very insightful, and uh, I, I definitely recommend anyone to watch it. And I want to thank you for your time today, and, and thanks for being honest uh, uh, with some of these questions, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me.